Hi there. So I want to say thank you to everyone who's commented or contacted me via Facebook and given me requests for topics they'd like to see covered in these videos. And one of the topics that uh, somebody suggested was uh, more about communication between devices. So if you've got a prop powered by an Arduino, how do you get it to talk to um, another prop or how do you get it to talk to a control software and have messages sent uh, between them to activate different functions? So there's uh, a whole load of different ways that you can get devices to communicate between each other. And I think what I'm going to do is to uh, kind of do one video for each of those um, possible methods. So, I mean, just looking around your house at the moment, you've probably got um, devices that communicate via Wi-Fi, uh, via infrared, via Bluetooth. Um, it's very common to use uh, RFID um, sensors uh, in, in the escape room props and things like that. Um, you might have wired Ethernet as well. So there's lots and lots of different methods. But the one I'm going to talk about uh, today is very simple uh, radio communication using uh, a radio transmitter and receiver that look like this. So these are very uh, common components that you can buy literally for a couple of pounds. We'll buy you um, a whole bag of them like this and they are very simple to interface with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. So they come in a pair. This is the transmitter component, the slightly more square shaped one, and it has pins at the bottom for uh, ground, a, a voltage input and a data input. And then this is the receiver that goes with it. Uh, and this also has a ground and a power supply and has uh, two data pins at the bottom. I, I don't really know why, if I'm totally honest, you can use either one of them. Um, now, obviously these transmit on 433 megahertz uh, radio frequency, and that is a frequency which uh, in most countries in the world is um, allowed to broadcast, short range broadcast, without needing a license. Um, so that's why they're popular. And it's the same frequency that's commonly used for things like uh, radio controlled models, radio controlled cars or planes, um, or some uh, remote control key fobs will also operate on that frequency as well. So there's a single data pin on the transmitter module, and there's a choice of two uh, data pins on the receiver module. And the way that data is encoded um, and sent through that radio wave is something called amplitude key shifting. But you don't really need to worry about the details of how that's implemented because there's lots of libraries available you can download and I'll show you some later in the code. Um, and they'll handle all of the low level um, addressing of, of how the data is actually encoded. So you can pass in a integer value or a floating point decimal value or a message that is a, a string of characters. Um, pass it to one of those libraries, they'll deal with how it's encoded into the radio wave and sent onto the transmit pin. Then uh, on the receiver end, again, it will handle all the decoding and you'll get back the same data type as what you sent in. So you can really choose any format you want um, as to how you want to send that message. But for example, you could have a sensor on one prop that's um, sensing anything you want, a light level or the value that a rotary knob has been turned to or a switch uh, or anything like that encodes the value, the reading from that sensor, transmits it from the transmitter to the receiver and then the receiver acts upon that sensor value in some way. Um, and also because they're acting on a common frequency um, it's possible to have a single transmitter sending a signal that is received by many receivers um, or similarly you can have lots and lots of transmitters all transmitting their signal to a the same receiver. Um, and you can encode some kind of um, sort of check digit at the beginning of the message to give an ID to which unit sent that message um, and which receiver receives it can send a message back again. So you can create quite a, a complicated, if you want it to be, um, network of different devices all talking wirelessly to each other with a very, very simple ad hoc network. Now. Before I show you uh, how to wire these um, modules in, there's one in very important thing I need to cover, uh, which is um, an aerial. Now, these devices, as they come like this, 
uh, typically don't have aerials on them but you'll see if I hold that up right there you'll see a little pin right in the corner there uh, hopefully if I hold that at the right distance you'll be able to see it my autofocus is struggling somewhat there but this pin in the corner here we go this pin here that says ant and that is a little uh, through hole connector for you to wire in an antenna and an antenna only needs to be uh, a length of solid core wire but it's important to get the uh, the length of wire right. Now you'd be forgiven to thinking that um, a longer aerial must be better, but that's not really the case. Um, aerials work best when they resonate with the frequency of the radio wave that they're trying to receive. Now, as I said, these uh, particular modules that I'm using and most of the common ones are on 433 megahertz. So that's the frequency that they operate at. Um, you can then work out the wavelength from the frequency because you know that radio waves travel at the speed of light. Um, so that's three times 10 to the eight meters a second. If the uh, frequency is 433 megahertz, that's times 10 to the six. And with a little bit of mass, I can tell you that the uh, wavelength of a single wave is about 70 centimeters then. And what you want to do normally is to make an aerial that is some uh, fraction of that uh, wavelength. So one common aerial design is something called a quarter wave uh, monopole and that's what this is. So it's very simply a straight stick of uh, relatively stiff uh, wire um, with a solid core so you don't want to have a wire that has sort of the, the twisted cable inside it with the strands you want a solid core in the middle and this is the length that is a quarter of the wavelength um, of the radio wave that you're trying to either transmit or receive. So for a 433 megahertz frequency uh, radio wave, your monopole quarter wavelength should be 17.3 um, centimeters. And you can simply uh, solder this in to the um, antenna socket in your um, transmitter and receiver there, you solder that joint in there and put it kind of perpendicular uh, to the plane of the um, uh, of the module like that. And that's a pretty good aerial and that, that will work quite well. Um, there's an alternative um, design called a dipole or a balanced dipole area. Um, that will be um, normally a half wavelength so that will be um, 34 and a half centimeters uh, extending both sides of the um, receiver or the transmitter module. Um, now the problem with both of those is um, you end up with quite long aerials and if you're using this in escape room and you want this to be a portable prop that's why you're using wireless communication in the first place you probably want it to also be quite a small prop and you don't want it to have aerials dangling everywhere. Um, but there's actually another aerial design which I found works really well with these kind of uh, units and it's something called um, a coil loaded antenna and the reason I like it is because it's actually very compact it's smaller even than the quarter wave um, monopole and it seems to have as good if not better performance than that aerial design uh, and it also seems to be um, uh, less sensitive to having its aerial correctly orientated normally if you have um, your transmitter uh, oriented vertically like this um, you would also want your receiver aerial to be um, oriented the same way um, because the way that the radio uh, waves will emit from an aerial like this will be circular um, in this plane um, so that the maximum amount will be received if the aerials were perpendicular to each other um, but because when you have coils like this it seems to make it um, uh, the, the radiation pattern seems to be a lot wider ranging. So um, the way you do this, so I've, uh, you start off with a length of wire probably slightly more than um, a quarter wavelength actually, you probably want about 25 centimeters of uh, wire and then you start at the bottom and you get about just over one and a half centimeters, uh, 1.7 millimeters, uh, 17 millimeters, something like that, straight up from the base. And then what I did is I coiled the uh, coiled the wire around a very thin screwdriver, and did 16 turns around the uh, screwdriver, 
And then at the top of that, I've then got uh, 5.3 centimetres straight again, like that. Um, so that is a, a coil-loaded antenna. And I have that on both the um, transmitter and the receiver units, exactly the same. Um, so with that soldered in place, um, I'm going to show you uh, some tests as to how good that um, aerial actually works. Um, but before I do that, I need to show you the rest of the wiring and some code. Okay, so let me talk you through the uh, wiring. So here over the left hand side, this is my uh, transmitter module. So you can see the 433 uh, RF unit here, uh, which has been plugged into the um, positive uh, power supply ground and this data line here, the green one. Um, now I'm using, um, rather than using an Arduino Uno for this project, I'm using com something called a DigiSpark instead. Um, you can use an Arduino Uno or you can use a Mega or a Nano. When people say they're making an Arduino project, I think a lot of people just assume that um, they're using an Uno because that's the most popular development board. But actually, um, there's a whole host of different hardware that you can program in exactly the same way. And for this project, when I just want something small and portable and I don't really need to use that many data pins, um, you can get away with using something a lot simpler instead, which is uh, the, the only reason why I'm using the DigiSpark here. Um, so I've got uh, I've got that data uh, line uh, wired in there, and that's going to the uh, P1 input there on the board. And then I've also just got a little push button here, um, and that is wired to uh, the P2 input, and has got ground on the other side of the um, pin. So uh, when I press that, that's going to be um, connect that signal to a low signal to ground, and that's what I'm going to use to transmit uh, the messages which go here to the receiver unit. So again, just to mix it up a bit, rather than using an Uno, I'm using uh, an Arduino Nano on this side, but you could use an Uno or a Mega or any other compatible board. Um, and this is uh, even simpler, really. So I've got the receiver unit wired into the 5 volt um, positive DC supply and to ground as well. And then I'm connecting one of these two data lines. Really doesn't matter which one. Um, like I said, I don't know why there's two data outputs because they send the same thing. Uh, that's going to one of the uh, inputs there. I'm using uh, A0, um, but it doesn't have to be an analog pin. It can be a digital pin. It's just a digital signal. And then I've just got an LED uh, wired into um, pin 13 with a series resistor as well. And I'm just going to flash that just to let me know that the receiver is receiving messages. Okay, so here's the code for the uh, transmitter unit to start with. Uh, so I'm using this uh, library called Virtual Wire. You can download this uh, after a quick Google search. It's, um, it's free to download. And um, it's actually quite an old library. I think it's about 10 years old now. Um, and you will find newer uh, RF communication libraries that have come out since Virtual Wire. In fact, the, the developer of Virtual Wire has made a new one called Radiohead. Um, and there's other libraries as well. But um, they typically come with more features um, and are bigger downloads. And although they provide greater functionality, I didn't actually need any of that uh, greater functionality. This is a, a smaller library and it runs on uh, simpler hardware as well. It doesn't need an SPI connection or anything like that. Um, so I'm carrying on using this um, library, even though officially it's it's possibly been replaced by a better model. It still works absolutely fine. So, um, you know, if it's not broken, don't bother fixing it. Um, here I define uh, a couple of constants. So as always, uh, I define as constant the pins which uh, the transmitter module is connected to. Now, even though um, I'm only transmitting from this unit, I'm not actually going to receive uh, on this unit, even though obviously you could have uh, a single unit receive and transmit. I'm still defining a receive pin. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the virtual wire library by default um, has certain pins assigned to it. And if you don't uh, override those pins, it will be trying to listen to a, a port that's either got nothing connected um, or it might not even exist depending on the hardware that you're trying to use. So I'm, I'm going to explicitly set a, uh, a receive and a transmit port and this thing here, this is the um, press to talk pin as well. Even though uh, that one and that one aren't actually going to be used, I will at least define them to a valid pin value um, and that will just prevent getting uh, any risk of errors. 
So this is the one that's actually uh, been connected to my transmitter module. Uh, bits per second is the transmission rate at which I'm going to send data. Um, and now what I'm going to do here to try to make something of a realistic uh, test. Like I said, you can encode and send any kind of data between these sorts of modules. You can send uh, just a numeric integer values or uh, decimal values. I'm going to actually send um, a character string. Um, partly to try to kind of increase the complexity of the message that's sent and partly because I want to check whether the received message has been um, uh, garbled at all. And the easiest way for me to do that is to actually send a real text string and then when it, uh, when it arrives at the receiver, if I check the message, if it still uh, makes sense, I know that it's been received successfully. So I've just defined uh, three three possible messages that are going to get sent here and they simply say hello secret and SOS but obviously that could say anything you want or it could be a sense of value um, and finally I've um, I've defined the pin that's attached to the button that I'm going to press it's actually going to send uh, the stream of messages um, so setup which is entered when the program still uh, first runs as always um, just dumps a little bit of information to the serial and we'll set up the serial connection this is the bit i was talking about earlier where i actually um, assign valid pin values for the press to talk button the receive pin and the transmit pin that are expected by the virtual wire library um, you need to do that uh, each time just to make sure that, that it'll work correctly and this actually starts the um, the virtual wire uh, session at the requested um, transfer speed. And then if we go onto the main program loop, it's actually not too uh, not too hard to say. So I just loop through, and the first thing I do is I check whether the um, transmit button has been pressed. Um, now I. Uh, So if it has been pressed, um, I enter this loop here and this loop uh, goes through 100 iterations and it uh, creates a new message string that's going to be sent and it just terminates it with this uh, null character here. That's how um, you know that the, you've, you've reached the end of the string is when you get to that character. Uh, then what I do here is because I'm I'm looping through this loop a hundred times and my loop counter is a variable called i up here. So the first part of my message is actually going to say what the message number was. So I convert my um, integer i variable here into a three uh, character string instead. Um, so that will obviously accept the values from from naught to a hundred. Uh, fine. And I'm going to append that as the first part of my message to send. So all my messages that are going to get sent are going to start with um, a number that shows what number in the, the stream this message was. And then I'm going to put a delimiter in after that. And then I'm going to choose one of the random messages that I defined at the top of the script. So it's either going to be hello, secret or SOS. Um, and because I'm just doing this as a test, I'm just going to pick uh, a random one of those strings each time and I'm going to uh, append that there. Um, finally, I'm going to call the vwsend function. That's what actually is going to send my whole message across. I'm going to wait for it to be sent and then I'm just going to wait for 50 milliseconds um, before going on to the next message. So what I should do at the end of this is every time uh, I press the button down on my transmitter modules, I'm going to get a hundred random messages sent across that are all going to start with a uh, number from one to a hundred or from zero, um, then a comma and then one of either hello secret or SOS. Okay, and here's the code for the receiver module. This bit's a little bit more um, involved, so I just pull out the key bits. So again, include the virtual wire library, define the pins that I'm going to um, use. Um, again, I'm actually only going to be receiving on this side, but I still define the other pins um, uh, just to make sure they're set to valid values. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create um, an array that's going to receive all of the messages that arrive from the transmitter. So my array is going to have uh, it's a, an array of uh, 
a character arrays. So it's going to have enough room to receive 100 messages because I know that's how many is going to be sent in the batch in the transmitter. And each of those messages is going to be up to a maximum length of max message length uh, long. So they're going to be character strings. Um, I'm also just going to keep track of the time that the last received uh, message uh, arrived at the unit. Um, and I'm going to place the unit into one of um, three states. It's either awaiting uh, a message or it's you know receiving a part of the batch of messages at the moment or it's got to the end of the batch. Um, this is just a little helper function that's going to clear out my arrays and uh, just reinitialize them all to an empty string again. And then here's my uh, setup function. So I begin by emptying the array, setting up the serial connection and setting up the virtual wire pins exactly as um, on the transmitter unit. In the loop function, so this is where it gets slightly more involved. So if the current state of the unit was that it was listening for uh, part of the burst of messages, but it's been more than two seconds since the last message was received, I'm going to change the state to say, okay, the transmission's ended. Because those messages were being sent by the transmitter with only a 50 millisecond delay. So if it's been more than two seconds since the last message, I think it's fair to say we've got to the end of the batch. And when we have got to the end of the batch, uh, I'm going to loop through all of the messages that were in the message received log, um, count them up, and also uh, print them out to the screen. And that's what's going to be my sort of very... Uh, simple analysis of, of the check of how many messages were successfully received by the receiver unit. Um, I'm then going to clear out the message log and begin waiting again for the next batch. So it should be a repeatable experiment. Um, if the unit is waiting for a message or if we've got to the end of the last batch then we can begin listening again to the first message of the next batch. So to do that I'm just going to initialize uh, a character buffer to hold the message in and then this vw get message function is part of the virtual wire library that's going to receive the character string uh, that arrived at the receiver unit and it's going to place it in uh, this variable called buff uh, and it's going to set the buff len variable to the size of the message that was received as well so if that function there returns true. It means that a message has been received at the receiver unit. So we'll say that the um, the receiver unit is currently in a state of receiving a transmission and we'll log the time that the last message was received. We'll flash the LED just to show that something's happening. And then what we do is we uh, loop through each character in the uh, array received and we place it into our message buffer and terminate it with a null string again just to say that we got to the end of the string. Um, we're going to remember that the start part of um, each message was actually a numeric value. We're going to send 100 messages and the very first part of the message was going to begin with a, a number to say this is message number 36 or 74 or 92 whatever uh, and that was separated by a comma. So we're going to use the, um, the string token method here, strutok, to separate out the part of the message that came before the comma and convert that into an integer value that we're going to use as an index in our array. Um, we're then going to take the rest of the message that was received, so the part after the comma, and we know that that is the message content. And then finally we're going to, uh, we're going to put that all into our array and turn the LED off. Okay, so let's test how these units actually work in practice. So here I've got my receiver module, uh, which is wired into the uh, USB input of my computer. And you can see the serial monitor uh, being displayed in the corner there from this unit here. And here I've got the uh, transmitter module, which I'm powering from a uh, battery supply just so I can uh, move around and test this out. You'll also notice I'm wearing my coat because I'm going to be going outside in a minute and it's very cold out there. But before I do that, let's try a simple internal test to start with. So uh, when I press the transmit button on the receiver, uh, you should see the LED flashing there just to show that that burst of 100 messages is being sent from this unit 
uh, 100 randomly chosen character messages from that uh, set of string messages that were defined. And you should hopefully be able to see the LED flashing on there. When they've all been received, uh, the serial output there shows the log of all the messages received. So 100 of 100 messages have been received successfully. Um, now that's hardly surprising because I'm only transmitting them across a 20 centimetre uh, gap between the units. So let's try a slightly more rigorous test. I'm going to go outside to the bottom of the garden and press that uh, transmit button again and we'll see how many of the 100 messages get through from there. Okay, so let's have a look. And okay, so unsurprisingly, um, we have lost a few of those messages, but notice that the vast majority of them are still being received, and the messages that are being received uh, have been received successfully. They're not being garbled at all. So we've dropped a couple of messages, but uh, we're still getting the large amount of the signal coming through, and that's through a glass door and uh, whatever that is, sort of 20, 20 metres away or something like that. So there you go. That's the uh, results of using these tiny little RF modules to transmit and receive. Um, and as you've seen, they're not 100% uh, reliable, and you probably wouldn't want to use them in a situation where you needed a message to definitely be received. So um, I wouldn't recommend them for using as a one-shot trigger, uh, let's say, to say when a, a particular puzzle had been solved or something. Um, you wouldn't just send a single message to the control room because there's no guarantee that that message would necessarily get received or acted on. However, they are quite useful um, in maybe non critical applications. If you consider more um, them to be a beacon that continually transmits uh, a state of um, some sensor or other. Um, as you saw in my example, when I send 100 messages, um, you know, 60, whatever it was, percent of them were being received still. And as the prop is moved around the room, so long as you're using an application that is not kind of mission critical at all, if a couple of those messages get dropped along the way, it really doesn't matter. Um, you can still have the receiver act upon whatever the most recent uh, message that did successfully get transmitted was. And you also saw that um, although messages sometimes got dropped, the messages that were received were received uh, intact and not garbled at all. So it's always safe to act upon whatever the content of the message received was, the worst thing that's going to happen is possibly it will be slightly out of date um, because a, no, a more recently transmitted message wasn't received. So there are applications for them um, that very very cheap and very easy to use um, so maybe you can think of a, a fun way to use them in a, uh, a non-critical way in your project. And that's about it. Thanks all very much for watching.